part one of Skeletons of Quito Quanaval, special assignment looked at the role of the South African Defence Force in the battles around the area in the late 1980s, and we met former SADF troops who fought there. We questioned whether healing is possible for the locals, who are still reeling from the effects of war and the landmines it left behind, while former soldiers like Johan Boysen prepared to go back to the area to heal emotional traumas. You, you need to come back and make peace for yourself because it haunts you. Uh, memories and the, even the fears that you experienced while you were up there. For you to experience healing, you need to speak about it. You need to break the avoidance. You need to, to have discussions about it. You need to go back to that horrible traumatic incident and address it again. Johan was sent to Quito Quanaval in 1987-88 when the area was the stage of a massive battle between rival Angolan factions Cuba and South Africa. In 1975, when Angola got its independence from Portugal, the MPLA, a local party, took control of the country, but it was opposed by rival faction UNITA. This led to a violent civil war between the two. In the mid to late 80s, the Cold War was still playing out between the USA and the former Soviet Union, causing both to get involved in Angola. The Soviets supported the communist-aligned MPLA's FAPLA army, while Cuba sent hundreds of thousands of troops to their aid. The USA, as well as South Africa, supported the anti-communist movement, UNITA. Uh, extreme. Uh, South African government by that time used to say that they were uh, stopping the expansion of uh, Russian and Cuban communism uh, from Angola to South Africa. <coughs> Angola was supporting ANC and Swapo troops, and that uh, was just justified the invasion of South Africa into Angolan territory. To try and push the forces back and allow UNITA to operate freely in this area, yes, because that would assist the aim of not allowing Swapo to move in here to be, in, to be able to infiltrate south. The intense fighting took place between 86 and 88 between Mavinga and Quito Quanaval. It's said that Cuba and FAPLA lost just over 4,700 soldiers and that the SADF lost a disputed 31. This, however, excludes the deaths of thousands of UNITA soldiers whom South Africa fought alongside. Today, all sides claim victory. The battles credited with leading to the signing of the 435 resolution, which saw both Cuba and South Africa withdraw from Angola and South Africa from Namibia, giving the country its independence. Despite this, the Angolan civil war continued for another decade. But the question remains whether the involvement of other countries only increased the fatalities on all sides. The SADF soldiers who fought at Quito were forcibly conscripted into the army, like 600,000 others, between 1968 and 1993. Many were unprepared for the role they'd play as aggressor in the border wars. It was a choice between going in the military or going to jail potentially or leaving the country. Many of our people were 17, 18 years old and, and uh, th that's the terrible thing of, of, of war. Former conscript Paul Morris regrets his involvement in the war in Angola. In 2012, he cycled 1,500 kilometers through Angola and Namibia to retrace his past steps and try find peace within himself and to interact with the local people. It was important for me um, to be able to explain, if I was going to talk about the war, to explain the subtleties of why I'd come back, you know, and that, that I thought that I, for example, that I, that I shouldn't have been there in the first place in, during the war, and that. You know, I believe that uh, South African involvement, you know, South Africans shouldn't have been involved in the war. And Tonight in part two, we follow Johan Boysen, who after 27 years goes on a similar trip to heal the emotional wounds of fighting at the Battle of Quito Quanaval. Can Johan cope when he comes face to face with his past? The closer we got to Quito, um, the more the build-up started in myself and a lot of old emotions came back in me again. Locals have no choice but to live with the painful reminders of the past as nearly three decade old war relics litter the landscape. And silent killers in the form of landmines lie dormant beneath the soil long after the war is over.
Han Boysen is one of the many 600,000 soldiers who were conscripted to the former SADF during the apartheid years, who's been left traumatized by his war experiences. The trauma still runs so deep that he battles to talk about it. I'm not comfortable in going into details, um, but what I can say is I'm not the only person who's got all of these emotions inside of us. Rolf Skuman was also a former SADF conscript. He now counsels ex-soldiers who suffer from trauma. Post-traumatic stress disorder is actually a very sad thing that the soldiers are experiencing because they don't realize the impact of this whole um, disorder on themselves and also the impact of that on their families. Because these individuals didn't get the proper assistance, they're actually uh, not coping with all the challenges uh, individually in the new society of maintaining themselves in the workplace or, or, or wherever and in their families. And now they're actually uh, uh, developing their own coping mechanisms like alcohol, drugs. Johan is returning to Quito Carnival in Angola to deal with his past demons. The trip there and back is over 5,000 kilometers by road. We cross through South Africa, Botswana and Namibia to get to Angola. Hundreds of kilometers of unforgiving dirt road awaits us. Johan and his group are making the trip on motorcycles. Because it takes you, it takes you on a, um, also once again emotional roller coaster ride. Because just when you think, okay, now I've got control of it, it brings something else with. We went quite up to scratch for the conditions. We didn't expect it to be that bad. Although we were warned beforehand, the Patrick said, you know what, it's going to be a tough road. Are you going to make it on the bikes? And we were adamant. Um, you know, I wanted to give everybody that little bit of time by themselves to work it through their head of the problems that we've got. Each one has got had a separate, separate reason for going. We travel the landscape of Angola for a number of tiring days over the dirt road. While we're traveling, we come across skeletons of machinery left behind from the war as everyday reminders to the people living there. While the site fascinates us, the locals have grown accustomed to living side by side with relics of the war. They carry on with their daily lives, just trying to survive with the little that they have. We're back on the road driving through what feels like hundreds of kilometers of nothing but bush. Some trees bark that they may be landmines along the road. We haven't passed any toilets for many hours. Those who seek to go in privacy need to venture from the safety of the road into the bush. Thoughts of the landmine warnings we've seen in other places leave an uneasy feeling in the gut when walking in the bush, which makes me wonder how the people here live like this every day. We stop at a small village which still bears the scars of civil war. We speak to one of the locals to try and understand what happened here. I was in the village at the time of the attack. The village was attacked while Fapla and Unita troops were fighting. Unita attacked and destroyed the village. The people had to flee into the bushes. Here, a rusted old Fapla tank still stands nearby as proof of those violent, destructive times which the people of Angola have had to bear. Back then, Unita is said to have attacked and burnt down many buildings, including this building where the nuns and nurses used to live. The little clinic in the village was also destroyed. This lonely wall is the only thing left standing of the former church. Ndala says they've been given no help to rebuild their lives. With the little that they have, they've constructed this modest church. A small school stands across the road displaying the Angolan flag. We're now in Monongi, a much larger town which used to be the supply base of the Fapla troops during the Battle of Quito Quanavol. Here we visit the Halo Trust, an NGO which has been in Angola for 20 years, removing and destroying the debris of war, such as landmines, explosives and weapons. This is our little display. It shows what we normally find into minefields. This, for example, is PPM2. This is buried underground. When you step this, it goes on and it can kill you, can injure you, 
a lot of problems. A report by the government body Canida in 2003 um, estimates that there are about 4 million so mines laid in Angola and that about 70,000 people have fallen victim to them. It's also affected building of roads and farming. Many people today are injured, they are amputees, and after 13 years there is a big difference because you can now circulate into roads, no problems in some of the roads. You can now go to cultivating fields, people have enough land to cultivate, and the government also is implementing their project, like building schools and doing other works. Former Angolan soldiers who fought alongside the Cubans are helping to locate mines that they planted. The SANDF has supplied maps to the Angolan government, which shows where they laid mines. But despite all their good work, funding for the NGO is drying up, partly because donors feel that Angola has enough resources to sustain itself. Tony says that they've only cleared about 40% of the mines in the Kuando Kubango province, in which Quito Quanavol falls. Last month I destroyed 900 mines in in, in Kubango only. So, so far in terms of statistics we have destroyed, since we are in Kuando Kubango, 32,000 anti-person mines, we have destroyed around 14,000 anti-tank mines. Before we depart for Quito Quanavol, we're all warned that the area is full of these silent killers which lie buried in the ground, waiting to be awakened from decades of slumber. The road between Menongi and Quito Quanavol is known as the Road of Death because so many men were killed on it during UNITA and SADF attacks on FAPLA supply convoys. Along this road, the bodies and skeletons of old trucks and military vehicles are especially visible, telling a tale of war and death. We're about six kilometers from Quito Carnival and we've come across a mass grave site where Angolan soldiers were buried after the battle. We're told that for 500 meters that way, 500 meters that way and 300 meters back, it's just grave sites where people have been buried. The closer we got to Quito, um, the more the build-up started in myself and a lot of old emotions came back in me again. Um, as I said, stuff like soil. You know, for you it's just dirt. I could smell it. It smelled differently. Um, the environment, everything there is just different and, 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 and it struck home again. And that brought all of those old feelings back into my system. And the fear was there. The groups finally arrived in Quito Quanavol. It's been 27 years since Johan was last here, and he's been waiting a long time to return. Our first stop is a war memorial in the town erected to commemorate the battle. We're accompanied by a former FAPLA commander who fought there. He receives his former enemies warmly and is eager to chat to them about the past as well as the present. The mood is relaxed and friendly. We killed each other here in Angola and now we are here together. You are very welcome here. As a military official, I'm going to take them for a drink at the bar and we will discuss the battle. Whose fighting was better than the other one? This is the only way for us to write the true African history. Our history has to be written by ourselves, not by Europeans or Americans. Thank God we are still alive, because we are in a position to heal the wounds and correct the failures of the past. It doesn't make a difference on which side of the line he was. Um, you, you bond immediately, because it, it's a feeling that only can be shared amongst each other. And I think he also understood what I was going through and the emotions inside of me. Um, for him at that stage it wasn't about who won the battle, it was we shared a common ground. Just then loud noises start going off in the distance. We're told that it's the sight and sound of old landmines being detonated and destroyed.
For Johan, the sound is so familiar and it resonates deep inside his core. When the landmines exploded, that fear within me just exploded. Uh, the emotions was just there. I didn't know what to do with it. Um, it, was, it was something I couldn't cope with. At that specific time, I didn't know how to cope with it. Um, there was people around me, my loved ones, and that, it rattled me, and very hard. My dad's a very quiet person when it comes to that. Um, he doesn't show emotion very easily. But once we were here, you can actually see, you, you, you can see it, it affected him. It's been arranged for us to go into the minefield with the Halo Trust to get up close and personal with these devices which continue the devastation of an old war. Signs of mine clearance are everywhere. Large craters frame the side of the road caused by mines which were detonated and destroyed. We stop and are allowed off the vehicle, but we have strict instructions to follow for our own safety. So right here we are in Samaria, uh, practically in Tumpu, and uh, we are in the minefield. Uh, we are having this corridor and we have these sticks which are painted red on top. Uh, we can't cross uh, that limit. A South African Ulifan tank, which was deserted in the minefield during the battle nearly three decades ago, was recently found here in December 2014. The area was previously inaccessible because of the mines. What bogged us down eventually was the minefields, because if you, if you go in with tanks and everything and you hit a mine, the tank stands because it's got tracks. And if you blow the tracks, you've got to get it out. So eventually the commanders at that time decided to uh, we, we, uh, not lose people, but leave the tanks there and, uh, and came out. The graves of some UNITA soldiers were also uncovered here during the demining process. These deceased men will likely remain unidentified forever. 2005 or up to uh, this 2015, which means 10 years of working. We have only cleared 25 uh, mine fields and uh, we are remaining with uh, 40 mine fields that are to be cleared, uh, which means we are having a lot of work ahead. A live landmine, slightly exposed, is shown to us. It's surreal to see something with so much potential deadly danger. Angola is one of the most landmine-dense countries in the world. 60% of war debris still needs to be clear. Visiting the minefields of Quito Carnival is a harsh reminder of how the devastating impacts of war can last for decades. We're taken to another war memorial site, this time in the Tumpo Triangle. It's not yet open to the public, and we're told that we're the first South Africans to come here. In the Tumpo Triangle, they've, they've put up these big billboards. I mean, uh, pictures have shot out SADF tanks and big um, maps of the maps of the, the war zone and where attacks came from and it just it's very militaristic you know it's and I'm not a you know I'm kind of anti-militaristic so you know and I guess if if you have um, the army involved in commemorating things then it's going to be militaristic but I'm not I'm not a, a soldier anymore and I'd like I would like to see it see something different I'd like to see something that was more um, I suppose more anti-war more saying let's not let it happen again It's our last day in Quito Carnival. The bikers will be distributing stationery and toys to the children. For Johan's group, it's a symbolic peace offering to the town. By reaching out to them, we can hopefully get peace within themselves, within the community, and also build a trust relationship or a type of relationship between ourselves and the town, which played a big role in, in the, 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 the actual New South Africa. Because Quito played a big role in it, um, but nobody is actually benefiting out of it except South Africa. Quito Carnival is not getting anything back from that. But order isn't maintained for long. Some children and adults manage to leave with numerous things, while others leave with nothing. 
But the books are in English, so the majority of the people here who speak only Portuguese will not even be able to read them. A little girl who can speak English reads for me while other children look on curiously. Once upon a time there was a pretty princess who had a golden bow. She was very fond of her bow and always played with it. The bikers hope to continue sending these types of donations to Quito Carnival. For them, it's a sign of goodwill. But will it have any bearing on reconciliation with Angola and the lives of the people there? The princess <laughs> sat down at the... After a number of days back on the treacherous dirt road, Johan and his group have reached the border to exit Angola. Well, we're exiting Angola today, going back to Rundu. Um, the last time I was in Angola, I was Kazovac out. So I actually feel quite well because this time I'm driving out. And um, it gave me a little bit of closure on that one. To go back and see that, that people are getting on with it, you know, even though, even though there's still minefields, you know, millions of mines being lifted um, and you know, military wreckage, the, the people are just you know, getting on with life. and it, it's, it's a healthy experience for someone like myself to go and see that this is just, this country is moving, moving beyond war now. I think it brought out something that I had inside of me for all of those years. Um, it opened up the wound, if I can call it that. I feel better. Um, there's stuff that haunted me which I've put behind me, but I don't think it will ever completely get out of my system. I'm still trying, we're talking about a month down the line, and I still have a lot of emotions inside of me, and, and, but I'm converting it into a passion for doing something more and not just stopping where I've been now and, and try and get more people involved in it. And that's helping me currently. While ex-soldiers like Paul and Johan regret their involvement in Angola and have attempted to reach out a hand of reconciliation to the people, a number of vocal former SADF soldiers on various websites don't share these views. While many seem to be holding on to the past, how many more want to make these reconciliatory visits but don't have the means to do so? You know, I read stuff, some stuff on the internet written by SADF veterans who are who are going on about um, SADF victories. I think it's it's um, I find it distasteful. I think it's in you know where we find ourselves in South Africa today. It's one thing to say, you know, it's one thing to have some allegiance to the the men you fought with and to your unit, but in the context of South Africa today, um, you know, bragging about about victories um, without some kind of attempt at making peace on the back of that is, is just, um, you know, it's just going to promote more conflict ultimately. Currently there's too much mudslinging between who won the battle and we forget about the people that fought the battle. Um, there isn't really support. You can go to your local psychologist, you can go to the government psychologist, but the only people that really understand what's inside of you is the guys that was up there with you and that's why they stick together. Um, that's why there's intercommunication on websites. These ex-soldiers who say they unwillingly formed part of the SADF, which fought to extend the lifespan of apartheid, say they found healing through their journeying back to Angola. But how long will it take the people of Angola to find their healing from a war which shaped their landscape and their lives? How long will it take them to rebuild their future? <laughs>